Alright everybody, welcome back. In this episode we're going to take 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah's victory at Carmel. And we're going to see Elijah meets Ahab here, and we'll take the first two verses uh, talking about the end of the drought. So, and it came to pass <clears throat> after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain to the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. So this is in the third year, this is a remarkable drought um, that lasted three and one half years by fervent prayer of Elijah. And earlier, God told Elijah to hide himself. Now it was time to present himself. And there is a time to hide and be alone with God, and there is also a time to be present uh, or to present ourselves to the world. And some wish to always remain hidden when they should step up and present themselves. And Elijah simply obeyed God's command. And though it happened through the prayers of Elijah, his prayers were sensitive to the leading of God. The drought did not begin or end as a result of Elijah's will, but at God's will. So this is that third and last year of the famine. God directed Elijah to present himself to King Ahab. And Elijah had God's word that he would end the drought. And the famine in the land was particularly severe in the capital, Samaria. Right, the famine in Elisha's days, uh, 2 King chapter 4, verse 38, chapter 6, verse 25, chapter 7, verse 4, and chapter 8, verse 1. God was directing this calamity, especially at the guilty parties, Ahab and Jezebel. Pay attention to the story of Jezebel. There's ties to the book of Revelation here. All right, verses 3 through 14, Elijah meets Obadiah. And Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken one hundred prophets and hidden them fifty to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. And Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go into the land, to all the springs of water, and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive, so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him, and he recognized him, and fell on his face, and said, Is that you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. So he said, How have I sinned that you are delivering your servant to the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said, He is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. Now you say, Go tell your master, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from you, that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place that I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab, and he can't find you, he's going to kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. And was it not reported to my Lord that when that what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your master, Elijah is here, and he will kill me. So this man Obadiah was a brave man who stood for God and his prophets in a very difficult time. This may be the same Obadiah whose prophecy against Edom is recorded among the minor prophets. It's a little difficult to be certain because there were 13 Obadiahs in the Old Testament. The Hebrew name for Obadiah means worshiper of Yahweh or servant of Yahweh or God. right? And Obadiah was sent out by King Jehoshaphat of Judah to teach the law in the cities of Judah, Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 7. And Obadiah was one of the overseers who helped repair the temple in the days of Josiah and the king of Judah, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 34, verse 12. And there was an Obadiah that was a priest in the days of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 5. So prophets, this name is not only given to such as are endowed with an extraordinary... Uh, or extraordinary spirit of prophecy, but to such ministers as de uh, that who devoted themselves to the service of God by preaching, praying, praising God, and the like. 
So account for it how you may, it is a singular circumstance that in the center of rebellion against God, there was one whose devotion to God was intense and distinguished. As it is horrible to find a Judas among the apostles, so it is grand to discover an Obadiah among Ahab's courtiers. And what grace must have been at work to maintain such a fire in the midst of the sea, such godliness in the midst of the vilest iniquity. So that Obadiah would have had a little difficulty in finding caves for the son of the prophets can be seen in that over 2,000 caves can be counted for in the Mount Carmel area. So the drought was so severe that King Ahab himself and his trusted servant Obadiah were out searching for pasture land. And God arranged this unexpected meeting between Obadiah and the prophet Elijah, right? God's behind the scenes here. And we might have supposed that he would have set himself to alleviate the miseries of his people, and above all, that he would have turned back to God. But no, his one thought was about the horses and mules of his uh, stud. And his only care was to save some of them alive, right? Ahab. And what selfishness is here? Mules and asses before his own people, right? Seeking for grass instead of seeking for God. So Obadiah knew that King Ahab conducted an exhaustive search for Elijah to punish him for the drought that his prayers imposed on Israel. And Obadiah feared that if he announced that he met Elijah and the prophet disappeared again, Ahab would punish Obadiah for letting Elijah get away. So Obadiah had a great responsibility in Ahab's court. He was in charge of Ahab's palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord, but not the writer of the Bible book of that name. Uh, whether Jezebel knew of Obadiah's commitment to the Lord isn't clear, but undoubtedly he and the queen were not close friends. Jezebel's aim was to kill the Lord's prophets and replace the worship of God with baal Makart worship. Right, And Obadiah, aware of her strategy, hidden a uh, hundred prophets of the Lord in the caves and was supplying them with food and water. A difficult task in the days of extreme famine and drought. Obviously, there were many in Israel who believed in the Lord, uh, though Israel as a whole had fell into an apostate state. So this situation prompted Ahab and his trusted servant Obadiah to go in different directions, looking for some grass in the valleys or near the springs where the most necessary animals, horses and mules, might graze. And Obadiah recognized Elijah when they met somewhere outside Samaria. Elijah was a wanted man in Israel. Out of respect for the prophet, Obadiah bowed down to the ground, and he could hardly believe that he actually found Elijah. Right, He'd been gone for all this time. So Obadiah, however, was afraid that Elijah would disappear again, as we see in the passage. And Obadiah explained to the prophet how Ahab had searched for him at home and abroad to no avail. And Obadiah affirmed the fact that by familiar words, as surely as the Lord your God lives, chapter 17, verses 1 and 12. So if he reported to his king that Elijah had been found, then he couldn't produce him. You know, and he wasn't able to like produce him if he disappeared again. Ahab would regard Obadiah's words as a mocking trick and would probably execute him. Then his fears were not altogether groundless, as may be learned from Second Kings chapter two, where we read that Elijah was carried into the other world in a fiery chariot. So to convince Elijah that his concern was sincere, Obadiah related proof that he was a devout believer to the Lord. Since his youth, uh, Obadiah seemed to think Elijah would have heard about his hiding and feeding the prophets of the Lord. Perhaps this was known among many of the faithful in Israel, especially the prophets, though of course not by Jezebel or her sympathizers. All right. Verses 15 16, Elijah assures Obadiah that he will meet with Ahab. Then Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. So kindly and wisely, Elijah responded to Obadiah's legitimate fears. He would not make Obadiah a martyr on his behalf. So Elijah's description of God as the Lord Almighty who lives and whom Elijah served in chapter 17 verse 1 and chapter 18 verse 36 will indicate that he was confident of God's ability to handle both the physical and spiritual situation in Israel. An assurance that had grown as a result, as a result of his experiences at both Cherith and Zarephath.
All right, verse 17 through 19, Elijah and Ahab trade accusations. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. But you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore sin and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab was easily the worst, most ungodly king that Israel ever had. Yet he did not hesitate to blame the godly prophet Elijah for the problems of Israel. And if Ahab would at least stop the act of persecution of the people of God, God would relent in the drought. But the wicked king of Israel found it easier to just blame the godly prophet. So according to his theology, it made sense for Ahab to blame Elijah. Ahab believed in Baal so much so that his government promoted and supported Baal worship and persecuted the worshipers of God. Ahab believed that Elijah had angered the sky god Baal and therefore Baal withheld the rain. Ahab probably thought that Baal would hold back the rain until Elijah was caught and executed. Instead, Ahab should have turned to the word of God and Deuteronomy 28 verses 23 through 24 promised that drought would come to a disobedient Israel. So Elijah challenged King Ahab to gather the idol prophets of Baal and Asherah for his meeting at Mount Carmel. And this is going to be great. Uh, gather to me all Israel by their deputies, heads, representatives, that they may be witness to all of our transactions. Right. So First Kings chapter 18 verse 36 makes it clear that Elijah did all this at the command of God. It wasn't some sort of clever idea or strategy. This is a God-inspired plan that Elijah obeyed. And it was important to confront and eliminate these prophets of Baal before God sent rain to the land of Israel. It was crucial that everyone understood that the rain came from God, not from Baal. So this refers to the fact that these prophets of Baal and Asherah were sponsored and supported by the government of Israel, having a special patron on the wicked Queen Jezebel. So Jezebel was not content with a private chapel, nor with her husband or her husband's readiness to pay uh, lip service to Baal. She meant to dethrone the God of Israel and make her Baal the chief duty, and her faith in the official state religion. So when Ahab heard Obadiah's message, the king went to meet the prophet. Elijah maintained the initiative as a spokesman of God to whom the king must submit. In Ahab's eyes, Elijah was the troubler of Israel. So Elijah met Ahab, insinuating remarks um, forthrightly by casting the challenge right back into his face. So Elijah set the record straight and instructed the king who did not perceive, nor was not uh, was he willing to admit that he and his father, Omri's family, in chapter 16, verses 20, 25 and 26 were the real reason for Israel's troubles. So Ahab had abandoned the Lord's commands in his law and instead followed the Baals. The plural Balaam refers to local idols of Baal in Judges chapter 2 verse 11, sometimes with differing names, right? Baal Barith in Judges chapter 8 verse 33, Baal Zebub in where we sound familiar, right? Baal Zebub, uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 verses 2 through 3, verse 6, and verse 16, right? All these are forms of Baal worship, paganism. Uh, so this was the real issue and the root cause of all the trouble in Israel, spiritual as well as physical. All right, so in view of Elijah's directive that Ahab was to summon the people from all over Israel, which is, uh, it's likely that hundreds, if not thousands, congregated on Mount Carmel. The Carmel Range of Mountains is uh, uh, 1,742 feet in elevation at its highest point. It extends about 30 miles to the southeast of modern-day Haifa from the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. It is a beautiful series of rounded peaks and valleys from which the sea can easily be seen. And it is a geographically prominent location and thus a fit setting for Elijah's contest. And it's not known exactly where along the ridge Elijah staged this uh, test. Any of the several sites is 
is probably possible. Uh, Morocco is suggested by many as one of the more probable sites. And the extent of Baal worship in Israel can be estimated by the number of priests Jezebel regularly fed, right? 750 prophets of the male god and 400 of the female goddess Asherah, or the groves. That's Baal's consort. Remember, groves is always a reference to trees carved into phallic symbols. These are fertility cults. Um, prostitution and so forth. All right, verses 20 and 21, Elijah challenges Israel to make a decision. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. And it is hard to know why Ahab did this, carrying out the instructions of Elijah. Perhaps he hoped that the people would be so angry with Elijah for the last three years of drought that this crowd would turn against the prophet. And these prophets of Baal hated Elijah. They loved the favor of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and they enthusiastically promoted the persecution of any true follower of God. But over the last three years, they had been severely humbled by Elijah and the drought sustained by his prayers. So all their cries to the weather god Baal were ineffective for three years. They hated this prophet of God who humiliated them and their sham priesthood so thoroughly. And we get a... uh, We can see that with what malignant glances, his every movement is watched by the priest. No tiger ever watched its victim more fiercely. If they may have their way, he will never touch yonder plane again, right? That lone man of heroic soul stemmed the fearful torrent of idolatry. And like a rock in mid-current, firmly stood his ground. He alone and single-handed was more than a match for all the priests of the palace and the groves, even as one lion scatters a flock of sheep. So this was a logical and useful question, right? How long will you falter between two opinions, either choose Lord or Baal? In general, the people of Israel were in a spiritually lukewarm condition, much like we are today. They wanted to give some devotion to both God and Baal, but the God of Israel was not interested in a divided devotion. Spiritually speaking, Israel was like an unfaithful partner in a marriage who doesn't want to give up their marriage partner, but also does not want to give up their illicit lover. The marriage partner was a legitimate claim to the exclusive devotion of their spouse. And the ancient Hebrew word translated falter means to limp, halt, hop, dance, or leap. And it's the same word used in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26, where the prophets of Baal leaped about the altar. And it may be that Elijah meant, how long will you dance between two opinions, right? So Adam Clark had a slightly different understanding of this. He said, literally, how long hop ye about upon two bows? This is a metaphor taken uh, from birds hopping from bow to bow, not knowing on which one to settle. Right? And the appeal of Elijah made it clear that there was a difference between the service of Baal and the servants of God. Perhaps in the minds of many, there was not a great difference. The only important thing was to have some kind of religion and to be sincere about that, following your heart to whatever God your heart might lead you to. Yet Elijah knew that it could never be this way. You either served Baal or you served God. There was a difference. Right? We have a jealous God. He's not a God on a list of ten or two or anything like that. He wants to be number one on a list of one, period. Elijah's appeal also called his hearers to account for the period of time in which they had not made a decision between Yahweh and Baal. How long, he asked them, how many more sermons do you want? How many more Sundays must roll away wasted, right? How many warnings, how many sicknesses, how many toilings of the Baal to warn you that you must die? How many graves must be dug for your family before you must be impressed? How many plagues and pestilences must ravage the city before you will turn to God in truth? And how long halt ye between two opinions? Same applies to us today. And look at the world. There was no objection and no repentance. They lacked the courage to either defend their position or to change it. They were willing to live unexamined lives of low conviction. And Elijah could so accurately see that their hearts, because he could see their actions, right? Uh, it was as if he said, I know you're not decided in opinion because you're not decided in practice. If God be God, then follow him. And if Baal, follow him. You're not decided in practice, right? You're 
your heart <laughs> drives your actions. This is why that whole argument of faith and works, you know, works for salvation. Like, if you have true faith and salvation because of faith plus nothing, that Jesus did everything on the cross, 1 Corinthians, you know, 15 verses 1 through 4, and you stand on that, that's your passport into heaven. The works come as a result of the changing of the heart, right? Then you start to, as you have sanctification and works come out of that. When you don't see works fall, you don't do works for salvation, that's backwards. Works comes as a result of salvation and faith. It is a symptom. <clears throat> Watch out for the difference between working for salvation and, or works to get salvation as opposed to works as a result of salvation. The New Testament is very clear on where God stands on that. All right. So Mount Carmel was agreed on by Ahab, and it would be a fitting site since it lay between Israel and Phoenicia, the lands of the deities in question. Also, Mount Carmel was regarded by the Phoenicians as the sacred dwelling place of Baal. So no doubt Ahab was highly pleased with this suggested site for the contest because it would have given the Baal prophets a definite advantage. But this did not worry Elijah, right? He's playing on their quote-unquote home turf. So rather, how long are you hobbling between two forks in the road? Uh, whatever translation one takes, the crystal meaning is clear. The issue was before them, a clear decision must be made. If Baal is going to be God, Jehovah had to be renounced. If Jehovah was to reign as God, Baal had, in all of his worship, must be forever abandoned. Many in Israel were being tempted to compromise. When all the people had assembled, Elijah stood before them and challenged them to end their double-mindedness, wavering between two opinions. All right, let's take verses 22 through 24. Elijah proposes a test between God and Baal. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces, and lay it on the wood. But put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you'll call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is the God. So all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So this was not true, right? I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. And Elijah had reason to know that it wasn't true. In the recent past, Obadiah had told him that he sheltered a hundred prophets of God against the persecution of Jezebel and Ahab. In this proposed test, Elijah was careful to give the prophets of Baal every potential advantage. They got to pick the two bulls. They picked which one they would sacrifice and which one Elijah would sacrifice. And the fire wasn't going to come from either Elijah nor the prophets of Baal. It had to be supernatural in origin and supplied by either Baal or Yahweh. And again, Elijah gave plenty of advantage to the prophets of Baal. It was thought that Baal was a sky god, lord of the weather, and sender of lightning, right? Thought to be fire of the sky. If Baal were real, then he could certainly send fire from heaven. So to put God and himself on the line before the gathered nation of Israel took a lot of faith. Elijah learned this faith over the many months of daily dependence on God, both at the book Cherith or brook Cherith and the widow's house at Zarephath. And of course, Elijah had plenty of reasons for confidence in the Lord God. First, he was following express instructions from the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. Second, he knew from the history of Israel that God could and would send fire upon heaven or from heaven upon uh, a sacrifice in Judges chapter 6, verses 20 and 21, and 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. So Elijah then pointed out that in this contest, the odds would be 450 to 1, a humanly impossible situation in which to win. And Elijah knew that there were other prophets of God besides himself in verse 13. But as far as this contest was concerned, he was the only one of the Lord's prophets left. Elijah would also introduce a 3 to 1 additional handicap here in verse 34 that we're going to get to. So each side was going to prepare a sacrifice. Um a bull as a burnt offering to its god and then they would each call on their god and the god who answered by fire would be shown as the true god and baal was supposedly a fertility god who could send rain cause the crops to grow provided food for his people and he was the one who supposedly sent fire or lightning from heaven the three and one half year drought uh and famine had been a great embarrassment to the worshipers of baal and it seemed as if elijah and his god rather than baal were in control of the fertility of israel so elijah's 
says to Baal followers seemed like a good opportunity to vindicate their god, and they readily agreed to it. When the preparations were completed, the test began. All right, verses 25 through 27, the prophets of Baal pray for fire from their god. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your god, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it. And called the na- they called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So the prophets of Baal had a devoted prayer life, and here they pray long, they play with great you know, passion. Uh, Yet because they did not pray to the real God, their prayer meant nothing, right? There was no voice and no one answered. And the prophets of Baal had a devoted prayer life. Here they prayed, uh, their worship was filled with enthusiasm and activity. Yet because it was not directed to the real God, the prayer meant nothing. And Elijah couldn't resist the opportunity to mock the prophets of Baal for their evidently foolish faith. And Elijah's irony bordered on sarcasm. The words meditating and busy can also be translated to be engaged in business, and it can also be used as a euphemism for bodily elimination, right? Going to the bathroom. Um, Rabbi Esjarchi gives this the most degrading meaning, right? I will give it in Latin because it is too coarse to be put in English, right? Fortasis ad locum secretum abit ut ventrim ibi exonerit. Right, perhaps he has gone to the blank. <laughs> right, and this certainly reduces Baal to the lowest degree of contempt, and with it the ridicule and sarcasm are complete. <laughs> So um, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them, and he mocked their ineffectiveness. With amusing and bold sarcasm, he suggested that perhaps Baal was thinking about other things, or pursuing, right, or relieving himself. Maybe he was away on a trip, right? The Phoenician sailors believed that Baal traveled with them on the Mediterranean Sea and elsewhere, or maybe he was even sleeping, right? He was mocking them. All right, verse 28 and 29, the prophets of Baal work harder at their prayer. So they cried aloud and they cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the gut, uh, <laughs> the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. These <laughs> prophets of Baal were utterly sincere and they were completely devoted to their religion. They were so committed that they expressed it in their own blood. They had the zeal, but without knowledge. Therefore, their zeal profited them nothing. The practice of self-inflicted wounds to arouse a deity's pity or response is attested to Ugarit when man, uh, when men bathed in their own blood like an ecstatic prophet. And this was done according to the rites of the barbarous religion. The blood of the bullock would not move him. They thought that their own blood might. And with it, they smeared themselves and on their sacrifice. Right. So this is a sad result of worshiping an imaginary God or the God of our own making. We may dedicate great sincerity, sacrifice, and devotion to such gods, but it means nothing. There is no one there to answer. Characteristically, Baal's prophets responded by increasing the fervor of their appeals. They worked themselves into a frenzy, and to propitiate their god, they mutilated their own bodies, as the custom of pagan worshippers has been for centuries. So this continued for three hours, right? The time of the Israelites' evening sacrifice in verse 36 was 3 p.m., but there was no response, and Baal did not respond to their six-hour chanting for lightning, though rain and lightning often come readily at the Carmel mountain range near the Mediterranean Sea. Mount Carmel overlooks the Bay of Haffa and uh, the Blue Mediterranean Sea. It's a long ridge, and way out yonder to the east is Megiddo and the Valley of Estralon. So in this dramatic spot, the lone majestic figure of Elijah stood apart. He was detached, and I think he looked bored after a few minutes of the performance by Baal's prophets. Then he gives this ironic smile across his face, and you could hear the acid sarcasm in his voice. He used the rapier of ridicule, and he taunted and jeered at these prophets, and finally with wilting scorn, he waved them aside. All right, verses 30 through 35. Elijah prepares his altar. 
Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. Then he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and it also filled the trench with water. Right? So he... When it was Elijah's turn to sacrifice, he first wanted to get the attention of the people. This was for their benefit, not his own or really primarily for the benefit of God. They needed to pay attention so they would see that the Lord was a true God in contrast to the silent Baal. Elijah was very aware that he repaired something that once stood strong. There was once an altar of the Lord of Carmel and Israel in general, and Elijah looked to revive something that once was. In wanting to make a deep impression upon the people, Elijah required more of God than he did of Baal. Elijah didn't even suggest to the prophets of Baal that they wet down their sacrifice once or twice, much less three times. Yet Elijah did this, confident that it was no harder for God to ignite a wet sacrifice than it was for him to set a dry one ablaze. So there can be no question of trickery, such as the use of a naphtha, a flammable liquid often used as a solvent. Instead of water or mirrors for ignition, as suggested by some scholars, the opposition was observant and close. So gather around me, folks, uh, essentially what's happening. When it was obvious to all the prophets of Baal uh, that they failed, Elijah invited all the people to draw near and observe what he was going to do. So he prepared an altar to the Lord, uh, which was previously built at this site long before, but it was in disrepair. So he selected 12 stones, one for each of the tribes. And though the tribes had been divided into two nations, they were still one people in God's purpose with a single Lord, a single covenant, and a single destiny. And after the bull had been slain and laid on the wood, Elijah gave another strange directive. He called for an additional handicap. He called for the whole sacrifice and its wood to be soaked with water three separate times. The excess water even filled the trench, right? The water, four large jars filled three times each, probably was collected from the spring in the mountain in the Kishon Valley below or from the Mediterranean Sea. The purpose of this soaking, of course, was to show everyone present that the burning of the sacrifice was about to take place. Uh, was not a natural phenomenon or a trick, but it, but it was actually a miracle. Also, the time involved in securing the water could have added to the tension of the hour, right? All right, verses 36 and 37, Elijah's prayer. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are a God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. So some 50 years before this, Jeroboam, the king of Israel, officially disassociated the citizens of the northern kingdom from the worship of the God of Israel at the temple in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, Elijah still remembered the evening sacrifice that was offered according to God's commandment every day at the temple in Jerusalem. And so both God, uh, let it be known that you are the God in Israel and I'm your servant. Both was important here. It was important for the people of Israel to know who their God was and whose God, uh, who God's servant was. And then I've, all, I've done all these things according to your word. This is also essential. It helps us to understand the whole event. Elijah did this according to the word of God. It wasn't prompted because of his own cleverness, because of the presumption, or because of vainglory. God led Elijah to do this showdown with the prophets of Baal. We, too, need to look at God's word, which is complete and total, both Old and New Testament together. Uh, it's funny how people pray, and they search, and they want all these answers, but they never look at what God is saying. God speaks to us today through the scripture. Jesus said it himself. It is finished. Right? <laughs> to tell us, die. Um, it is 
no whim of his to chastise the nation with a drought, and it was no scheme of his concocted in his own brain that he should put the godhead of Jehovah or Baal to the test by a sacrifice to be consumed by miraculous fire. So Spurgeon recommended that believers use the same principle in prayer, especially those who preach the word of God. Go you to the mercy seat with this as one of your arguments. Lord, I have done according to thy word. Now let it be seen that it is even so, that I have preached thy word, and thou hast said, It shall not return unto me void. I have prayed for these people, and thou hast said, The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Let it be seen that this is according to thy word. Right? We should ask to be a part of God's plan, not our plan. We should pray to understand God's word, not our situation. Right? All these personal stories and situations in the Old Testament is for our learning. And you can take a lot away from all the human interaction from God's point of view, how he looks at these situations. Like all the answers to life are in this book. You just have to dig through it. And there's really no excuse in a, in today's world when we have blue letter Bible apps that allows you to literally do word searches through an app on your phone, pull up commentary, and you have a whole library of information at your fingertips now. But people are lazy. I think inherently people like to be willingly ignorant. So at the time of the Israelites' evening sacrifice at 3 p.m., Elijah stepped forward and prayed. Without any of the theatrics, uh, his adversaries Elijah simply addressed God as one addresses another living person. His words were designated to demonstrate to the onlookers that all he had done as God's servant, chapter 17, verse 1, chapter 18, verse 15, had been in obedience to God's command and was not his own initiative. <clears throat> all right, verses 38 through 40, the result, God answers my fire. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. So the prophets of Baal had passion, commitment, sincerity, devotion, and great energy. What they did not have was a God in heaven who answered by fire. And the action of this fire in every case was downward, contrary to the nature of all earthly and material fire. Elijah's petition had lasted less than a minute but produced spectacular results. The difference lay in the one addressed. So when the fire of God fell, its work was beyond expectation. It would have been enough if they merely cut up pieces of the bull and on the altar were ignited, but God wanted a more than simple vindication. He wanted to glorify himself among the people, right? And at this moment, the people were completely persuaded, asked to choose between Baal and Yahweh, God. There was no choice to make. Obviously, the Lord was God. So tragically, this was only a momentary persuasion, and this was no lasting revival in Israel. The people were decidedly persuaded, but not lastingly changed. And since this was a contest between God and Baal, the prophets of each deity had to be responsible for their respective results. The great sin of King Ahab was his official sponsorship of the prophets of Baal. And now that the fraud of Baal was exposed, his prophets had to answer for it and were dealt with according to the law of Moses. And you can find that in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 5, verses 13 through 18, uh, chapter 17, verses 2 through 5, and chapter 18, verses 9 through 22. So Elijah simply demanded that the prophets of Baal receive the treatment they promoted for the prophets of God. Giving it right back to him. So spontaneously the crowd cried out in amazement since the Lord Yahweh had answered by fire. Verse 24, they acknowledged that he was the true God. And the Kishon Valley ran parallel to the Carmel Range on its north side. There the people slaughtered the false prophets in obedience to the command of God through Moses. Deuteronomy 13 uh, verses 12 through 15 and Elijah. All right, Verses 41 through 44. Elijah plays for rain. So then Elijah went to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, uh, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he bowed down to the ground. He put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. And so he said, Go up, said Ahab, prepare your chair 
chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So Elijah knew that once an official worship of Baal had been defeated, the purpose for the drought was fulfilled and rain was on the way. So Elijah and Ahab would now each do what they wanted to do. Elijah would pray and Ahab would eat. And we have an unusual posture of prayer for Elijah. He wasn't kneeling, he wasn't sitting, he wasn't standing. He didn't lay prostrate before the Lord. This shows that the power in prayer resides in faith in the living God. We scarcely recognize him. He seems so to have lost his identity, right? A few hours before, he stood erect as an oak of Bashan. Now he is bowed as a bulrush, right? And as God's ambassador, he pleaded with man. Now as man's intercessor, he pleads with God. And it is not always so that the men who stand straightest in the presence of sin bow lowest in the presence of God. So, and it came to pass the seventh time, this is a stubbornly persistent prayer. And it wasn't as if Elijah would not take no for an answer because he had confidence that God's will was to send rain. He stubbornly furthered the will of God by his persistent prayer, right? Go again seven times. Let us not be dejected for some disappointments, but continue to wait upon God who will answer me and that speedily. God's promises are given not to restrain, but to incite to prayer. They show the direction in which we may speak and the extent to which we may expect an answer. They are the mold in which we may pour our our fervid spirits without fear. So Elijah prayed, asking in faith for God to send the rain. Elijah obviously sensed um, that it was the will of God, yet it was his fervent prayer that brought the rain. The evidence of the rain came slowly and in a small way, but out of the small evidence, God brought a mighty work. So in the November 9th, 1904 edition of the Life of Faith, a London newspaper dedicated to the Deeper Life movement, a writer named Jesse Penn Lewis reported on a remarkable work just beginning in Wales under the ministry of men like Evan Roberts and Seth Joshua. She reported that a cloud no bigger than a man's hand had risen in Wales, and it was a fitting description of the clear but small beginning of what became a mighty work. Charles Spurgeon used this text as an illustration of the small signs that precede a mighty work of God. He spoke of four certain signs and tokens for good uh, which prayerful faith clearly perceives when an awakening genuine revival is about to come. Christians should regard the following things as clouds as small as a man hand um, rising out of the sea, right? A growing dissatisfaction with the present state of things and an increasing anxiety among the members of the church for the salvation of souls. When this anxiety leads believers to be exceedingly earnest and important in prayer, and when ministers begin to take counsel one with another and say, what must we do? And when we shall see the doctrine of the individual responsibility of each Christian fully felt and carried out into individual action, right? It's not enough to just show up to a place once a week and then walk away not knowing anything of what's going on in the Bible. Cherry picking verses and giving a 30 minute, you know, opinion speech on it. We have to break down the word like this and understand what is happening in each of these stories to understand what God's plan is. You're not going to get there by cherry picking. It's just not going to happen. So this was a word of faith from Elijah to Ahab based only on the sighting of a cloud that was small as a man's hand. He knew that a torrent was on its way. So Ahab rode down the mountain to celebrate the end of the drought by eating and drinking, but Elijah walked back up the mountain to pray for rain, and his posture as he prayed reflected the earnestness of his petition, again, for the glory of God. And rains normally came off the west, off the Mediterranean Sea, so Elijah instructed his servant to look in that direction. Verses 45 and 46, Elijah's amazing 14-mile cross-country run. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain, so Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So God's word through Elijah was proved true. The long drought was over and it was demonstrated that the powers of Elijah both withheld the rain and then subsequently brought the rain. And this was obviously supernaturally empowered 14 mile cross country run, right? He girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab. We don't know exactly why it was important for God uh, or why it was important to God for Elijah to reach Jezreel first. Perhaps it was so that he could be the first to tell Queen Jezebel. To demonstrate that he was neither ashamed nor afraid 
afraid of what he had done, though he knew how Je- Jezebel was going to resent it. Um, but he does venture himself in the midst of his enemies as being confident of the divine power and protection. And that Elijah could have made such a run as assured in the Arab runners could easily cover 100 miles in two days. Man, he was booking it, though. That is a trek. So, at first, the rain cloud was small like a man's hand, but soon the whole sky grew black and heavy rain descended. The torrent evidently overtook Ahab as he rode his in his chariot to Jezreel, his winter capital about midway between Mount Carmel and Samaria. So, Elijah overtook him, running the approximate 25 miles with divinely given energy. Uh, tucking his coat into his belt enabled him to run without tripping over the long, long garment. Job 30 verse 3 in Job chapter 40 verse 7. Uh, because of Mount Carmel, Elijah had discredited Baal and his worshippers, but he also had humiliated the vindictive Queen Jezebel. Alright, that ties up chapter 18. Next time, when we get into chapter 19, we will talk about Ahab's wicked wife. Thank you for joining me.